Network Talk Times. I combine all the videos about urine analysis into this one long video. I hope you enjoyed it. Without further ado, let us get into it. Let us get into it. Almost every time when I go to see my doctor, I'm asked to provide a urine sample, regardless of why I was there. Does this sound familiar to you? Do you ever stop and ask yourself, why do I need to pee in a cup when I come here for a cold or a flu? And more importantly, not problems in a restroom department, that's for sure. But yet I have to pee in a cup even before I can see a doctor. I think most of us who are watching this video have experienced this at least once, right? Tell me down below that I'm not the only one here. The truth is, your urine can tell a lot about your health as you will see in a bit. That leads to our first question. Why is urine analysis done? Urine analysis is done to check your overall health. Urine analysis is one of the most frequent tests done as a part of routine health screening. Likely due to simplicity in collections and how much it can tell us about your health. A urine analysis can find infection problems such as UTI, urinary tract infections, or even more serious problems such as kidney failure, kidney stones, diabetes, liver disease, pregnancy, and so much more. Wow, who knew urine can tell us so much? What is urine analysis? Urine analysis is simply analysis of urine by looking at and testing the physical, chemical, and microscopic properties of the patient urine sample. The urine specimens are easily obtained for the most part. Nonetheless, there are a few collection methods to help people who have difficult voiding urine. We will also be talking about these methods in a little bit. Prior to urine analysis, a clean urine sample is collected into a specimen cup and brought to laboratory for testing. It is best to transport it to laboratory as soon as possible because delaying in testing could alter the test results. For instance, bacteria could multiply during the time that specimen is awaiting testing and the bilirubin level change due to light exposure. Generally speaking, urine is one of the easiest specimens to obtain. Accurate test results begin with a proper specimen collection. Urine specimens are not hard to obtain, but there are several methods available if needed, such as clean catch, catheterization, superpubic aspirations, and urine collection bag. Clean catch or midstream. Clean catch or midstream specimen is the most commonly used as specimen collection method, and it is the easiest way. If the urine specimen is to be used for culture, the specimen should be collected in a sterile cup. It is almost always done in a sterile cup anyways, just in case a urine culture is necessary after urine analysis. What is the proper way to collect clean cash or midstream specimen? First, prior to collection, the external genitalia has to be cleaned thoroughly with a mild antiseptic solution. Usually, patients will be given a packet containing a tissue soaked in mild antiseptic solution to clean the external genitalia with. Second, when cleaning with sterile wipe, be sure to focus on the urinary opening. Men should wipe the tip of the peanut. Women can clean their labia from front to back. Third, the actual collection part of your urine. We divided the urine into three parts. The initial, middle, and end portion. This may be a little bit tricky, but this is how it should be collected. Void the initial portions of your urine and let it go down the toilet. Open the sterile containers and continue without touching the outside of your genitalia area. And the end portion of your urine should go down the toilet as well. Up next is urine collected by catheterization. This is usually done with patients who have difficulty relieving themselves. It is also sometimes used for female patients to avoid contaminations like menstrual blood. 
Another benefit of urine collections by catheter is that, once inserted, we can monitor the patient's urine output and also have continuous access to the urine samples. Even though this method could avoid contamination, the procedure of inserting the catheter could introduce bacteria and cause infections if not done properly. Due to the difficulty of the collection method and potential danger, catheterization is not routinely used. Superpubic aspirations A superpubic aspiration is another method that can be used to obtain a sterile urine specimen. This can be used in place of the catheter if only one specimen is needed. This method is done by inserting a needle directly into the bladder and collecting urine samples. Benefits of using these methods are to avoid contaminations from vaginal and ureters and can also be used to obtain urine from infants and small children. Urine Collection Bag This method is used to obtain urine from infants and small children. A pediatric urine collection bag is attached to the patient's genitalia. The bags are soft and pliable and cause little discomfort to the patient. However, one thing to be watched out for this method is fecal contamination. Before we get into more details about testing process in the next video, have you ever taken a look at your own urines and noticed the different colors? For instance, first morning urine tends to be darker yellow, to amber, or even honey color. This is because your body was dehydrated overnight. Have you noticed any other urine colors? If you have, do you know what the colors tell you about your health? If you haven't, then take a look before you flush next time, but don't forget to flush though. In the next video, I will talk about the physical part of urine analysis, which also includes the different color of urines and what each color means. I hope to see you then. Hi, Blood Talk fans. Previously, we have talked about what, why, and pre-analytical of urine analysis. Well, today we are getting to the fun part. We will be focusing on the physical parts of the urine analysis. The routine urine analysis include physical characteristic examinations of the urine, such as color, turbidity, odor, and specific gravity. Stick around and you will learn some interesting property of your urine. Without further ado, let us get into it. Everyone has a different normal color of urine, but it should fall on the yellow spectrum. The color of your urine is mostly determined by how much water you drink. If you drink a lot of water, your urine should appear clear or pale yellow. If you are dehydrated, your urine could appear dark yellow or amber. Beside the amount of water you drink, food that you consume also influences the color of your urine. There are a wide range of urine colors, and I will not name them all. I will point out the most commonly seen. Here are some of the common colors of urine that you may have seen before. Pale yellow or clear means healthy and well hydrated. Bright yellow means excess of B vitamin. You know if you are taking a B vitamin supplement because of the bright color urine, almost like a highlighter yellow. Red color urine could mean many things. I understand that it is alarming when seeing red urine because it could mean bleeding somewhere in the urinary tract. The bleeding can come from anywhere from kidney to urethra. However, red urine can also come from contaminations. An example is contamination with menstrual blood. This is why it is important to be careful during the collection process as well as choosing the right method to obtain the specimen. Some medications can also cause urine to be red. Another reason that your urine could be red or has shades of red color is if you are eating a lot of beetroot or blackberries. Orange could mean a few different things as well. Orange urine could have significant medical conditions like hyperbilirubinemia. This means that the blood bilirubin level is elevated. 
so that the kidney has to filter out more bilirubin from the blood. Therefore, higher concentrations of the bilirubin in the urine, which give urine orange color. Orange urine is often found in patients with liver disease and hemolysis. Some medications can also give urine orange color as well. Your food consumption can make urine orange if you consume an excess amount of vitamin A or vitamin B complex. Or a lot of orange color food like carrots, your urine can have orange color. Brown and black. Brown and black urine is not common, but it can be alarming when it happens. Because brown and black color urine can come from any cause of red or orange urine, but in a more severe condition. Urine that contains red cells and heme pigments can range from pink to black because it is also influenced by the pH and the contact time between pigment and urine. For instance, acid urine, which contains hemoglobin, will darken as the contact time increases due to the formations of methemoglobin. This contact time includes the time of urine inside the body waiting to be collected and when the specimen is already collected. You see, another reason why specimens should be sent to the laboratory as soon as possible for the most accurate test results. It is scary to see brown or black urine, but it doesn't always mean bad news because there are medications that can cause urine to turn brown and black. However, if you see this, Please contact your doctor immediately. Green. Green urine is not very common, but can be found in patients with urinary tract infection secondary to Pseudomonas infection. Like most other urine colors, patient medications and food consumptions play a role here as well. Clearity or turbidity test. Normal urine is clear but can be cloudy due to medical condition like UTI or precipitate crystal in urine, which we will be talking about it in microscopic of the urine analysis. But we'll touch base on it a little bit here. First, amorphous phosphate in alkali urine. Amorphous phosphates are white precipitate, which will dissolve when acid is added. Second, amorphous urea. In an acid urine, amorphous urea usually have pink color, which can be confused with red blood cells. But amorphous urea will dissolve if the specimen is heated. Third, the urine can also appear cloudy if leukocyte or white blood cells, epithelial cells, and bacteria are present. All these subspecies can confirm during microscopic examinations of the urine sediment, which we will be talking about it in the following video. Foam and odor. Foam and odor are not routinely reported as a part of urine analysis, but when CLS notice any significant, we'll make a note about it. Foamy urine suggests that the urine has protein presence which can be confirmed with the chemical part of urine analysis. Odor. Your urine odor can tell a bit about your health as well. Did you surprise? I was when I first learned about it. Here are some examples of what I'm talking about. For example, if your urine smells sweet or fruity, it suggests that urine has ketones present. If your urine smells very pungent, it may contain bacteria. And here is a few more examples. Specific gravity. The specific gravity is the ratio of weight of a volume of urine to the weight of the same volume of distal water at a constant temperature. This was a mouthful, wasn't it? This was a definition given to me when I was in my class. Let me try to explain it another way. The specific gravity is a test that compares the density of the urine to the density of distal water at the same temperature. Distal water is purified water without any minerals, while urine has other substrate that our kidney filter out beside water. 
the normal range of specific gravity of urine is 1.003 to 1.035. Water specific gravity is 1. There are some conditions that would change the specific gravity of a urine and terminology that CLS should know because it does show up on exams. Hypostaurea Hypostaurea is used to describe a urine with a consistently low specific gravity. Hypostaurea is a concentration problem, so the urine is consistently diluted. This condition can be found in patients with diabetes insipidus. The patient with diabetes insipidus, the urine-specific gravity is really low because in this disease, there is a deficiency or resistance of ADH. Hypothyuria is used to describe a urine with consistently high specific gravity. This could indicate dehydration or medical conditions like diabetes mellitus. In diabetes mellitus, this is a deficiency of insulin and excess of glucose. Glucose molecules are very dense and therefore the urine will have a very high specific gravity. Isothyuria refers to a fixed specific gravity of 1.010, which indicate poor tubular reabsorptions. Patients in this condition will have urine-specific gravity around 1.010, regardless if they are dehydrated or well hydrated. This condition coincides with advanced kidney failure because the kidney lost the ability to concentrate urine. Hi Blood Talk fans, we are going to continue with urine analysis. Today's focus will be on the chemical part of the urine analysis. It is the main part of the test and is sometimes referred to as urine dipstick test or just dipstick test. It is really interesting how much a thin plastic stick containing various paths of chemicals can tell us about our health. Without further ado, let us get into it. The chemical portions of the urine analysis test is the bulk of this test. A dipstick test is a common term used to refer to the chemical portions of urine analysis. This is a reference to the actions of submerging a testing strip into a urine sample. The testing strip has chemical paths on it, which is where the reactions take place. The test results are determined by the color changes of these paths. A standard urine test strip has up to 10 different chemical paths which change colors once it comes in contact with liquid or urine in this case. This is what the individual strip looks like and the color chart on the bottle is what we use to compare the color changes to. After we dip the testing strip into the sample, the chemical reaction starts and the indicator of each path will change to indicate the presence, absence, and semi-qualitative on each of these 10 tests. Another thing to keep in mind is that once the strip comes into contact with urine, the reaction starts and each reaction has to read at a certain time. If you read the reactions too early or too late, the result will not be accurate. Now that the general information is out of the way, we can go over each reaction in a little bit more detail. So for each test, I will cover health issues that are associated with it, chemical reactions, reagent used, and what can cause fault positive and fault negative for each of these tests. We will go in the order that we have to read the reactions, but keep in mind that the order may vary a little depending on which manufacturer you use. Glucose. Glucose in urine is called glycouria or glucouria, which indicate high glucose level in your bloodstream. This is usually due to diabetes, but can also be from other acute illness. The glucose path should be read between 30 seconds to 60 seconds, depending on the manufacturer. The results report range from negative to 2000 microliter per deciliter. The color change range from blue to brown. Here is the reactions and reagents. What can give false positive test results? Contaminations from strong oxidizing cleaning reagents like peroxide and hypochlorite. 
and what can give false negative test results. Temperature has effect on MSI reactivity, so it is indirectly affect the test. If the specific gravity decreases, the sensitivity of glucose oxidase also decreases. Alkali urine also decreases sensitivity for glucose. Another thing that affects is the high level of vitamin C. The high level of vitamin C can inhibit the enzymatic reaction. Bilirubin. A small amount of bilirubin in urine is normal. However, an increased amount could indicate some serious health issue, include hepatitis, liver disease, gallstone, hemolysis, and constipation. Bilirubin is light sensitive, so the urine should be tested as soon as possible and protect from light after collection. The path for the urine test reads between 30 seconds to 60 seconds after dipping. The chemical path color changes from light yellow to tan. These colors corresponded to the level of bilirubin from negative to large amount of bilirubin. And here is the reactions and reagent. What can give false positive test results? First, if the reaction is read after manufacture indication. Second, some medications can interfere with this test. And what can give false negative test results? First, a large amount of ascorbic acid. Second, if the urine has left for too long before the test is performed, the bilirubin will oxidize as specimen exposed to light at room temperature. Ketose. Ketone in the urine indicating excessive fat breakdown for energy. This often occurs in diabetic, starvation, or low carb diet. A normal amount of ketone in blood is between 2 to 4 mg per deciliter. Ketone's results are read at around 40 seconds. The color changes from buff pink to maroon color. The reaction is reported as negative, trace, moderate, or large or can be reported from negative to 160 mg per deciliter. And here is the reactions and reagents for this test. For false positive and false negative test results, if the urine is pigmented or have high specific gravity and low pH, these can cause false positive test results. And for the false negative test results, if the urine is contaminated with acetone, the acetone can give a false negative test results. Specific gravity. We have talked about specific gravity before in the physical part of urine analysis. It is because there are two ways to do specific gravity tests. One way is to manually perform this test, and another way is as a part of the dipstick. Specific gravity tells us how dilute or concentrate the urine is giving a decent indicator of hydration status. Low specific gravity often indicate renal failure or diabetic insipidus, whereas high specific gravity indicate dehydration. The reactions for specific gravity should be read at 45 seconds. The reagent path contain a pH indicator. The indicator that is for specific gravity is actually measuring the pH that is changed as the urine increase or decrease its specific gravity. Blood. The urine dipstick is sensitive for hemoglobin, but it is also able to detect myoglobin. The presence of hemoglobin in urine is called hemoglobin urea. The presence of myoglobin in urine is called myoglobin urea. Conditions that can cause the presence of blood in urine may be UTI, kidney damage, high alkaline, or vagina contaminations. Blood reactions are read at 60 seconds. Intact red blood cell gives green spots on yellow or orange background, whereas free hemoglobin or myoglobin will be uniform yellow to green to dark blue color. The results are reported as trace or moderate of intact red blood cells or trace 2, 3 plus amongst hemoglobin. And here is the reactions and reagents for this test.
Now let's talk about fall positive and fault negative. For fall positive, contamination with oxidizing reagents like hypochlorite and menstrual blood can cause fall positive test results. As for the false negative test results, a high level of ascorbic acid can give a false negative result, as well as not missing the sample thoroughly before the test can also give a false negative because the RBC is heavy and it could settle down at the bottom of the specimen cup. pH The pH of normal urine is between 4.5 to 8 with an average of 6. There are two main reasons for knowing urine pH. One is for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Since the kidney is one of the two organs that regulate acid and base in our body. Another is to help with crystal formations identification found during microscopic part of the urine analysis. Your kidneys vary the urine pH to compensate for your diet and metabolism. Your diets can influence by acidity of the urine. Protein-rich diet tends to produce acid urine, while vegetable-based diet tends to produce alkali urine. The chemical paths indicate pH by using two different indicators. One indicator will change from orange to yellow when the urine pH is 5 to 6.5. Another indicator will change from green to blue when the urine pH is between 7 to 8.5. Proteins The urine dipsticks protein is more sensitive for albumin than other type of proteins. If protein is present in large quantities, the surface tensions of urine will be altered. So if you agitate the urine, it will cause the foam to develop on the surface of the urine. Protein in urine can be transient or indicate an underlying renal disease. Here are some medical conditions that we can see the presence of protein in the urine. The protein path is read at 60 seconds after dipping in the urine. This is a colorimetric method used in dipstick based on the concept known as protein error of indicators. The indicator change from yellow to green in presence of urine. The results can be reported as negative to 4 plus or negative to 2000 mg per deciliter according to the color change. There are a few things that can cause false positive test results for protein. First, alkali urine. And second is if you leave the dipstick in the urine for too long because of the buffer that's on the pad will get washed out. There are a few reasons to cause a false negative test results for the protein. The first one is if the urine is too diluted. The second is if there are other protein present in the urine besides albumin. Like I said, the pad is more sensitive for the albumin. Uroburinogen Screening for uroburinogen is useful for liver function disorders. One of the issues in measuring uroburinogen is its instability. The uroburinogen is converted to urobilin on standing in the presence of oxygen and on exposure to air. One unique thing about eulobrinogen level is it peaks between 2 to 4 p.m. Eulobrinogen results can be read at 60 seconds and here is the reactions and reagents for this test. Some medications can cause false positive test results and a high level of nitrate and the presence of formalin can give a false negative test results for eulobrinogen test. Nitrate. Nitrate is used for early detections and is symptomatic bacteria urea. Here are some common organisms that can cause urinary tract infections. The best specimen of choice for suspicions of UTI is the first morning urine because it is the most concentrated one. Nitrate test results are read at 60 seconds, may vary a little bit depending on the manufacturer. If the path changed to pink color, is decayed a positive test. And here is the reactions and reagents for this test. For false positive test results, 
If the urine is left for too long at room temperature before test is performed, this can give false positive test results because during the time that specimen is waiting for testing, microorganisms can grow in the specimen and generate nitrate. A red urine can also give a false positive test result as well. For false negative test results, high specific gravity and high level of ascorbic acid can give false negative test results. There are some facts that need to be cautious about in interpreting nitrate test results. A negative test result should not be interpreted as no bacteria infections. You may think, why is that the case? Here are some reasons. First, there are many bacteria that produce nitrate, but there are also many bacteria that do not produce nitrate. Second, urine may not remain in the bladder for long enough before the specimen was collected. The urine that remains in the bladder for 4 hours or more is the better specimen. And a high level of urobilinogen. Another thing to keep in mind is, this dipstick is not a replacement for bacteria microscopy, which we will talk more about it in the next video. Leukocyte history, an increased number of white blood cells is one indicator of urinary tract infections. Usually, for a UTI, you will also have an increase in white blood cells, elevated pH, protein, and nitrate. The most common white blood cells seen in urine sample is the neutrophil. The neutrophils contain enzyme known as esterase. This esterase is what is used to detect the presence of white blood cells. That's why the test called leukocyte esterase. Here is the reactions and reagents for this test. After dipping the urine dipstick in the urine sample, leukoesterate results are read at 2 minutes. A positive reaction produce a lavender to purple color. The results are reported as negative to 3 plus. There are a few things that can cause false positive test results. A strong oxidizing reagent, vaginal discharge, preservatives like formalin, false negative, high specific gravity, and contain glucose and proteins. The reason that these can cause false negative results because in the presence of glucose and protein, they will increase the specific gravity of the urine, and when all those conditions are met, the white blood cells will crater and cannot release the esterase. And since the test is measure the esterate that released by white blood cells, if the white blood cells cannot release the esterate, so the chemical that is on the path won't be able to detect the presence of white blood cells. Hi, Blood Talk fans. Today is the third part of urine analysis, microscopy, but it is the fourth video about urine analysis. Don't be too confused. We're just gonna go with microscopic examination today. In the microscopic examinations, we will be looking at the urine sediment for white blood cells, red blood cells, bacteria, crystal, and cas. This used together with the urine physical and chemical analysis. Without further ado, let us get into it. After examining physical and chemical analysis of the urine, it is time for microscopy examination. For me, this is the most exciting part of urine analysis. Maybe I'm biased because I love microscopy. If you also love microscopy work, please let me know. Just type I love microscopy or just microscopy. Specimen condition. Before the start of microscopic examinations, take a note of the specimen's age and storage condition into consideration. For instance, if the specimen has been left at room temperature for 4 hours and you see abundance of bacteria, does that suggest that the patient may have UTI or is that due to bacteria growth after the fact? Well, if you store the urine in refrigerator, that would help fix the problem, right? What do you think? Well, let's see. Refrigerating the urine sample is one way to preserve urine that is waiting for examinations and for transportation. If refrigerated the urine gives us the benefits of limiting the bacteria growth, then what is the problem? The problem is that once the urine is refrigerated, crystals can form due to change in temperature. Now, if we see the crystal in urine, what should we do? 
Does that mean you should never report crystals seen in the urine samples that has been refrigerated? No, it doesn't. Because there are ways that we can treat the sample and give the most accurate test results, given the specimens and the specimen condition we have. We will go through a few of those techniques as we go along as well. Preparations of urine for microscopy First, mix the urine gently, do not shake because you don't want to create bubbles or if the container is not closed tightly, you may end up having some of the urine on yourself. The reason that you want to mix the urine gently before microscopy examination is if you leave the urine sitting for a while, red blood cells and white blood cells can settle to the bottoms and you may miss those. Second, label and then pour out about 10 ml of well-mixed urine sample into urine analysis centrifuge tube. Third, centrifuge the urine sample for about 5 to 10 minutes at 200 rpm. Fourth, gently pour out supinant. Be careful not to disturb the pellet. Only leave about 1 ml to suspend the pellet with. Fifth, make sure you suspend the pellet and mix well before sampling the urine for examination. Sixth, drop a drop of urine onto a microscope slide and place a cover slip on top. Try to avoid bubble because that could affect how well the urine sediment distributes. Microscope. First, examine the specimen in the bright field microscope. Do not start by staining the urine. If you need to stain the urine for further examinations, that process should be done after a bright field microscopic examination, so you don't miss other findings. Second, adjust the brightness. Not too bright and not too dark. If the microscope is too bright, you may miss some structure like Helen Cass. The best way I can describe it is to adjust to where you can see the age of the cells and other casts clearly. You may need to adjust this a few times in the beginning to find the best lighting for yourself. But once you are getting used to it, this step won't take more than a few seconds. You can either adjust the brightness at the diaphragms or some newer microscope models has a dimmer switch. Third, most laboratories have microscope assigned for the urine bench already, so you won't have to do much of adjustment. Use a fine adjustment knob to help you focus. During the examination, you would want to keep adjusting the fine adjustment knob constantly to look at the objects and structure that are on the different focal plane. Fourth, review the sediments at low power magnifications. Scan the slide for cast, crystal, and other elements. Switch to a higher power when necessary to tell the type of the cast or want a better look at the object. Reporting results. This is a tricky one because each facility may impose different rules and how they want their results to be reported. Also, different types of objects also report differently. Here are some examples. First, cast are report as the average number of casts seen at low power magnifications in 10 to 15 fields. The casts can be reported in number or reported as rare to many. Second, the cells like red blood cells and white blood cells should be viewed and report in a higher magnifications and reported in range 0 to 2, 2 to 5, and so on. For the rest of the things that we can find in the settlements, I will mention as we go along. What are the possible treasures that you can find? As much as I would like to mention every single possible structure you may see in urine settlements, I cannot. I will group them into cells, bacteria, crystals, casts, parasites, miscellaneous, and other facts. Let's start with cells. Red blood cells. Red blood cells in urine can come from any part of the urinary tract. It can also come from menstrual blood in female patients. Since it doesn't look red under the bright field microscope, but you still can tell that it is red blood cells. The red blood cells does not have nuclear, appear as pale or yellowish, 
and smooth biconcave discs approximately 7 microns in diameter and 2 micron thick. From the side wheel, you may see red blood cells as hourglass shape. What about lice red blood cells? You still can see lice red blood cells. They are referred to as ghost cells. They are fainted colorless circle because you are looking at red blood cells membranes with nothing inside. Red blood cell lies in hypotonic urine and crinine in hypertonic urine. Hematuria is the presence of an increased number of red blood cells in the urine. There are a number of reasons for the increased number of red blood cells such as UTI, renal stone, sickle cell anemia, or just heavy exercise. It is normal to see 1-2 to two red blood cells per high power view. To report red blood cells observations, Red blood cells are quantified as numbers of cells in high power view. White blood cells White blood cells are the same as red blood cells in the sense that it can enter the urinary tract anywhere. On average, a normal urine contains about 2 white blood cells per high power view. White blood cells are larger than red blood cells, usually spherical and appear dull gray or green yellowish under microscope. White blood cells shrink in hypertonic urine and lies in hypotonic urine, which is the opposite of red blood cells. An increase of white blood cells in urine associated with inflammatory, UTI, contamination with vagina secretions, dehydration, stress, and more. Epithelial cells If you can differentiate the types of epithelial cells, you can narrow down where the problem is. The three main types of epithelial cells in urine samples are renotubule, transitional, and squamous. Renotubular epithelial cells Renotubular epithelial cells are slightly larger than leukocyte and contain a large round nucleus. Increased number of tubular epithelial cells suggest tubular damage. The damage can be caused from acute tubular necrosis, or form a kidney transplant rejection. Traditional epithelial cells look similar to pear shape. These cells may contain two nuclei. This type of cell lie the urinary tract from kidney to upper portions of urethra. Squamous epithelial cells. This type of epithelial cells is easily recognized because it is large and in regular shape. This type of cells is in the urethra and vagina. Bacteria The presence of bacteria is a common finding in urine. However, the increased amounts are consistent with UTI. Nonetheless, the presence of bacteria alone cannot determine that the patient has UTI. The presence of bacteria with negative leukocyte ester and a negative nitrate suggests that the high number of bacteria is due to poor collection technique. Crystals Crystals are usually not found in fresh urine. The formations of crystals is depend on concentrations of ions and molecules and pH. In some cases, the crystal can form in the kidney and urinary tract and results in stones. Many of the crystals are non-pathologic and insignificant except in case like metabolic disorders and medications regulations. Each crystal has unique properties and can be identified by either their appearance, pH, and solubility. Let's start with the crystals that can be found in acidic urine. Amorphous urea Amorphous urea are yellow to red brown granular in appearance. This type of crystal does not have known clinical significance. Uric acid. This type of crystal comes in different shapes, but the most common shape is diamonds and the rosette. It associates with tumor lysis syndrome. Calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate has a unique shape. They look like envelope. They're soluble in hydrochloric acid, but insoluble in acidic acid. And that's how we can verify if this crystal is calcium oxalate by adding different acid into the urine and see if the crystal is dissolved. 
Calcium oxalate is normal, especially after consumption of certain foods like tomatoes, spinach, garlic, orange, asparagus, and a large dose of vitamin C. An increased number of calcium oxalate crystals can be pathologic conditions like liver disease, diabetic mentalis, and severe chronic renal disease. There are more crystals that can be found in acidic urine, and a few that worth mentioning. I will put them and the pictures in the next few slides, but just note that there are many more that I have not mentioned it here. There are many crystals that can be found in alkali urine as well. I will mention a few of them here. First, amorphous phosphate. These are granulated particles, have no defined shape, visually the same as amorphous urea, but the urine pH helps distinguish between the two of them. Calcium carbonate. The crystals are small, colorless, appearing in dumbbells shape. This crystal doesn't have clinical significance from what I know, given that it's not an excessive amount. Casts Urine casts are long cylinder structures, no dark edges, formed in the lumens of the tubular of the kidney. Acidic and concentrated urines promote formations of casts. Casts have parallel sides and rounded or blooded in. The shape and size are very. The casts can either be straight or curled and have different lengths. Helen cast. Helen cast is the most commonly found type of cast in a urine sample. A few Helen cast can be found in a normal urine. An increased amount of Helen cast can be found when exercise and if the patient is dehydrated. There are different type of casts like red blood cells, white blood cells, granular, epidural cells, wax, and fatty casts. Parasites Parasites may occasionally be found in urine. This can be the result of vagina or fecal contaminations as well. Unlike bacteria, the presence of parasites cannot be confirmed with the chemical analysis of the urines, which is why microscopic examinations is the key for identifying parasites in urine specimen. Trichomonas Trichomonas is the most common parasite found in urine specimen. It has about the same size as a large white blood cells. If the parasite is dead, it can easily be mistaken as white blood cells. The parasites can be found in both male and female patients. If the patients have trichomonas, you will see an increased number of white blood cells and epithelial cells. The key features that you can tell the difference between the trichomonas and the white blood cell is the trichomonas have fragilis, and if the sample is fresh, you can see them moving. And here are a few other parasites that can also be found in urine. Now, let's talk about artifacts and contaminations. Most common contamination that I personally seen when I was doing urine analysis are cold fiber and starch crystals. Cold fibers are the most common type. It comes from clothing, diaper, and lens paper. Fiber can be mistaken for cast, so you have to be very careful. But since the fibers are artificial, when you look in microscope, the edges are a lot sharper than casts. For starch crystals, the starch crystals are round or oval, highly refractive, and varies in size. Thank you for staying with me until the end. What do you want to know next? Do you want to know more about blood bank? 
chemistry, microbiology. If you have any burning questions, please feel free to leave me a comment down below. Lastly, if you have not done so, please like, share, subscribe, and click the notification bell. I will see you in the next episode of Blood Talks. And as always, remember, your blood tells you the story of your health. Thanks for watching. Bye.